any problems with the technical stuff? Not really. We, we kind of got that sus. We can build pretty much anything. So a game with under half a million lines and actually quite simple structures should be easy for us. But um, it seems that not. So disciplines, design, art, audio writing, coding. There are others, but I'm sort of going for a, a very high level here. The main thing to look at is, is it polished? Every time you look at the game, is there something that jars? Is there something that you can do to improve it? So on the design, is it Unix and do you know this? There's, um, I'm, I'm assuming this is not a spoiler because everyone's seen Jurassic Park by now, I'd hope. In Jurassic Park, you've got this fantastic world. They've managed to recreate dinosaurs from their DNA. Dinosaurs are moving around. We believe every single word of it. And then this 12-year-old goes up, oh, this is Unix, I knew this. And all of a sudden, you don't believe that world at all. You believe dinosaurs can be rebuilt from their DNA, but when you see that as Unix, it just takes you out. Every time that happens, you have to fix your game. You don't want any of those issues. That's, and that's the design level, that's the design phase. So you've got to make that play okay. You've got the fact that I call it the Goldilocks zone. It's just right. It's like not too easy, not too hard. My general rule for this is always the first level of the game should be so easy, even I can win it. Uh, that makes you feel good. You play the game, you win it, think, yeah, I get this, I understand this, I like playing this. Then you go on the second level, make it a little bit harder. There's always lots of design questions. Put the hangman up there as a very interesting case of design. How many lines should there be in a game of hangman? How many lives do you get or how many things do you do before it ends? There, I think I've got about 10 or 11. That's probably a bad number. Hangman, you just guess letters to try and work out the word. The most commonly used letters in the English language for English words is E-T-A-O-N-I-R-S in that order. Well, that's already ten letters. If I just went through each of those letters in turn, after ten of them, I have got 80% of the most common words spelt. So having ten on a hangman is not a good game design feature. So you've got to think, well, what can I do to improve that design? Do you say, well, no vowels for the first three turns? How do you improve? How, what can you change to make that game worth playing? Art stuff, um, most obvious thing, your image data is not your collision data. You should be very generous with what you let the player get away with. And you should, allow, you know, in the case of the hit rocks, you want the player to feel, yes, I just managed to miss it. If they technically hit it, let them get away with it sometimes. Because it, it does make you feel good, and if it's too, uh, too accurate, you, you can, you know, the player will die and the, the person will go, oh, can't, it's only by pixel, really? <laughs> yes, let them off occasionally. Um, everything's, yeah, make data, um, interface. Remove, relocate, and represent. I, tr I tried an alliteration, that's the closest I could find. The, the less interface you can have in your game, the better. Real life does not have a HUD, but every game seems to want one. If you can move it by putting it into the game itself, making it something in situ, that's more natural. Uh, Doom did this years ago. It's, uh, you know, you'd have your health, but actually there'd be a picture of the main guy with blood coming out. And the more blood there was, the less health you had. It was a very nice way of representing a value in the game which wasn't the HUD. You're not, if you're playing a game and you, and like a first person and you're shooting everything in sight, you do not have the time to look at a score or look at a health, read the number, parse it and work out, am I really damaged? Can I go into this firefight? Is it worth it? You just want to be able to look quickly and go, yep, I can see that the health bar is right down. I can see there's lots of blood on the character. This is going to be dangerous. So if possible, move the interface into the game itself. Represent the bullets as, so you can see them on the gun, for example. If you can't, then move it somewhere where it's less intrusive. Audio. This is one of my favourite things. Uh, there's a lot of audio in your life, but it's not actually real. Uh, Newton Foley is partly named for Isaac Newton, who realised that for every action there was an equal and opposite reaction, and for a guy called Foley, who back in the 1920s, I think it was, or 30s, in Hollywood, came up with the idea that everything you see on film has to have sound. Now, even those in the cheap seats can't hear my footsteps, but if this was film, my foot feet would be making footstep sounds. 
You can't hear it. There's enough other noise that means you can't. But if you see it on film, you expect as a human to hear that noise, even though it's emphatical. So you've got to have those sound effects in there, because it just feels natural. You're used to it, because Hollywood has brought you up in this way. And it, if you think about how many sound there are, you might be surprised. Take my example of the first person shooter again. How many sounds are there for a gun? Well, there's just a gun sound, it's just a, a bang, that's it. But there's also the reload sound. There may be a separate sound for the safety catch, the cocking of the gun. You might have additional sounds for uh, the bullet as it hits the wall, there'll be a ricochet sound. Every different type of material in your world has a different ricochet sound. You might have the bullet casings dropping onto the floor. Again, every different type of floor surface needs a different type of sound. This is seven types of sound effect for one gun. You want to have three or four guns, you're looking at 20 or 30 sound effects. Every time you say, oh, I'll just add one more little sound to make it better, you are then creating another set of sounds that you need for every other gun. Polish begats polish. Every time you add something because it makes it good, you suddenly realize you've got to then make everything else just as good. And the work goes on and on and on like that. Funnily enough, we don't pay enough attention to writing. I kind of think we should. Everyone seems to have a word processor on their computer, and as a consequence, everyone thinks they're a writer. It's not that easy. Writing good dialogue is hard. Getting people to act out good dialogue is even harder. But even the most banal shooting games have a backstory. <laughs> even in things like Doom and Quake, it's just something simple. You are a marine, you have to go and shoot stuff. That is enough of a backstory to go, okay, I get it. But you've still to create that story. There's still a reason there. Are you running towards something? Are you running away from something? Even those two different simple ideas actually changes the way you as a player think about that game, uh, how you'll interact with it. Create yourself a nomenclature. If you're saying press the A button, don't suddenly switch it to touch the A button a little bit later on. If you're talking about firing a bomb, don't suddenly switch the terminology to say missile halfway through. And this, also, this includes variable namings as well. There are only three things hard, you know, cache invalidation and naming things. Oh, and off by one else. So keep the same names everywhere. Uh, and, and try and use contextual and emotional language at all possible. The pirate game example is a Kadankan example. If you're writing a pirate game and you have to have health in this game, how would you label the health? Maybe percentage, maybe a little bar. Well, how about having health ranges where it's named as rabid, infested, crippled, or something like that? Words that really point out that you are a pirate. A life of a pirate is not nice. So create those words which really match into that environment. And with the pirate thing, it's very easy because you can say, well, even the 100% health level is called rabid which shows you that life as a pirate is never nice. Even when you're at maximum health, you're still a bit scurvy related. Oh, if you're doing games um, intended to cross over between English and American, then words like punk and lid are kind of the same thing. But if, you're, you know, if the game is set in America, you have to use American words. It might seem obvious, but it's the obvious things that get missed. I even had to translate one of my games from English into American once. It was quite surreal. Uh, on the technical side of writing, handle translations, um, you have all the text in a separate file so again you as a developer don't have to go through the machinations when someone updates the text. You also have a lot of collateral to write. It might seem like the easy bit at the end, oh I'll just write the instructions later or I'll write the website copy or there's still a lot of work that needs doing to write all of that uh, stuff. Uh, coding, yeah, this is kind of really the easy bit. Make sure you test everything. The length one is a really fun example. Uh, there was a game way, b way back where you could go into a store and you could buy minus one bullets. This actually meant you got given money because the computer just says, oh yeah, number bought multiplied by cost and add this on. So it's a really nice way of getting through the game. You've got to check this stuff. Um, Random's not random, I take it everyone knows that, but it's unfortunate because it makes testing really awkward sometimes. So I'll go on to Space Bouncer, so this is a simple game, it's just a HTML5 thing. And I'll just play through it, well, briefly play through it, and see how many bits that you can spot that might be B or cover, assuming it's going to work. 
It says I've got Wi-Fi. If not, this talk will be even shorter then. <laughs> oh, okay, reloading again. And I'm aware that the fade is slow, it's iPad. Ding, ding, ding. Well, another thing you can't hear here, actually, is there's um, a three-chord motif. Uh, that's just to say, you know, it's a title screen. There is an identity associated with it. Again, it's not a big thing to put in, but it is something you should always remember to put in. Here on the title, the O of bound and the A of space are slightly different to the normal font. That's it's giving an identity. Doesn't take a lot to do, but again, it's another thing. And you think, yeah, it's only a little thing, it's a little thing here. If every little thing here just takes one hour to write or to put in, and it's a hundred things that you need to do, that's already a hundred hours. So let's play. Here we go, this is a little space guy. He's, oh no, he's got sort of, uh, he's going down this uh, shaft. If I press the button, he'll jump across. And he's going, wee, he does so. He's collecting these trilithium uh, crystals here, which help power the spaceship so that he can escape from the planet. Again, it's not big, um, but it still took an absolute age to do. So, when we get to the bottom, here we go. Success. And it goes on to the next level, which is slightly faster. So, what's actually going on in that game? What are the extra bits that put in there. Well, give yourself a point for everyone you spotted. So the stylized font, it would look pretty silly if it was using a font like the A-Team or something like that. The imprints we did, there's fading in there, although it's slow on my iPad. Each button has an in-out version and a hover. The level design, every single one of those obstacles has been put in a position to ensure that it is possible to do every level. Uh, the, separate win uh, the wind sequence at the start is unique. The health bar fades in. Um, it's impossible to lose that level, even if I didn't touch anything and you hit everything on that screen, you will still get through it. Uh, all, all the fading in and out, that's all in there. Uh, each level, that keeps going on and on, there's more crystals, it's deeper, there's more obstacles, it's faster. So every single time you go into a new level, something changes, there's always a little bit extra going on. Um, there's lots of nice visuals in there, the sky is a gradient, the moon, exact. did anyone spot the moon? on the game? No. Nope. Well the moon's up there in the top left and what I do is I actually look at the time and date from the computer and I put the moon in the correct astronomical position which is to say if it's a full moon out that moon on the screen will be in full moon and if it's a crescent in real life that moon will be crescent. Who can honestly say they spotted that? <laughs> These are stupid little things that I enjoy doing and, I, and when the audience that plays your game see that you've done that they suddenly go ah oh, they paid attention, they care about this game enough to waste time on something that seemed so useless. But actually, you suddenly look at it and go, yeah, they love that. They love writing that game as much as I love playing it. And there's animations on everything, the screen effects, there's loads of pulsating things. So um, I'm going to wrap up there and open to questions. Um, these are the books that I've written on games, but I get so little in royalties, it's not worth you buying them. Just buy me a beer and I'll do everything that's in them. <laughs> Um, and, and anyone asks good questions, I've actually got a couple of copies here which I can throw out. Um, so uh, that's me. I'll update my scorecard now. So there we go. 64 stem. So uh, questions? Oh, already. already. Uh, uh, that, does it mean uh, that the astronaut in your game escapes the Earth <laughs> since it's the actual moon? From yes, it isn't really. Can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah. So the question is, is, is this not actually technically on Earth because it's our moon? And it's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did come up with a name for the planet to do that. It's, you know, yes, it's, it technically is incorrect. Uh, but I think people are going to be more interested by the fact that it is astronomically correct than they're going to start querying that. You know, ignore what I said earlier about making sure the world is cohesive. Other questions? Ooh. Oh, yes, we do. So, to someone, I guess, would you say it's better to have a simpler polish game than something with fancy graphics mm -hmm. and less of stuff that actually doesn't mm -hmm. play well? Yeah. So, the question is is it better to have a simpler game that is nicely polished? And the answer is yes. Uh, you know, if you're 
going for a job, you want to do this stuff commercially, having one thing that's really nicely polished is better than having 200 things that are all half done, maybe a little bit broken here and there. Just get one thing. Get, it's so easy to start something. It's so difficult to finish. If you can finish it with all the polish in, you get a lot more cost and credit and everything else by doing that. Definitely the way. There's one. Oh, I've got two at the back. This side first. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you uh, spend your time on, on polishing the intro screens, uh, menus, and whatnot, but the, uh, doesn't that raise the expect, uh, expectation people have of your game and when they play it, and it's strictly well li not living up to their uh, <laughs> expectations? You do yeah. So yeah, yeah. So the question is, uh, if you polish the title screen and everything else, does it not raise the expectations? And the answer is, yes it does, and yes it should. You should set the player up to really want to get into this game. Uh, there's a tea show in uh, England called Mastermind, which is a very simple quiz show. You get asked questions on your specialist subject, and then on uh, general knowledge. That show starts with deep, booming music. The studio is black. All you see is a chair in the middle. It's like an interrogation. That sets up your expectation for the rest of the show, which is firing questions at you one after another. It's good to set up those expectations. It really draws you in. There's a question over here. Yeah, so with early access games that release less polish than they would, have they waited? Yeah. yeah. But they have more money to release a polished version. Does releasing the unpolished version early sort of taint the game's image to the public? Do you recommend yeah. they waited longer without mm -hmm. the extra funding and just finish the game? Yeah, the question is with early release games, uh, would it be better if they waited and actually finished a, uh, uh, released a finished version? And yes, they really should. Uh, unfortunately, uh, commercials such as they are uh, require you to get something out because a game that has been released will make more money than a game that sits on someone's hard drive. So there is that commercial requirement that's often uh, above the integrity of the game. You, you are pretty sure that every time you see a game that's a bit broken, you know the developers knew it was broken. They knew it shouldn't have been shipped, but it wasn't their decision to make. There was some management somewhere that said, no, we have to release this or there's no company. There are so many, I've worked in so many game companies where if we didn't get the game out, there literally would be no company left. But the, the margins were that small. There's questions here and here, I think. Uh, this last question brings us to the open source mantra of release early and really often. Mm. Uh, is this compatible with uh, games? It, it mm -hmm. does it have a meaning to release it even if it's just beta, so that maybe you attract tributors or something like that? Yeah, so the question is, this goes against the open source mantra of release early release often. Unfortunately, it does. And this is one of those dichotomies between open source and games. You really don't want to release early. You do want to be able to say, this is perfect, this is finished. Again, there might be other commercial reasons why you've got to ship it out. Uh, but if you are able to just say, no, it's, it's, you, know, you will get some people that go, oh, okay, I kind of like this. I'm going to get into it now. I'm going to start helping on this project. But a lot of the time they go, this is, it looks awful. Why do I want to spend time on this project? It looks awful. Or it plays badly. It's very difficult within this kind of environment with games for you to look past at something that's a bit shoddy. Um, <coughs> short question. Uh, my question is, what is the smallest practical size of a group of people to start on a game? Like, you need so many disciplines, you need mm -hmm. art, you need music, you need writing. Yeah. So, so what's the smallest number of people you can start a game with? Uh, generally one. Because uh, it will always start with one. It's very difficult to have an idea with someone. You might, you'll have the idea, like, wouldn't it be great to do a game where you're falling down a mine shaft? You then talk with someone about that. They go, oh yeah, this, well how about that? And from that point it starts growing. Most people have to be multiple disciplined in the game arena. Because in order to get it from that idea in your head to something that you can tell someone else about, you have to at least do either a little bit of coding or a little bit of artwork. It's not great. It says, this is my idea. And then print it that way. Uh, but as I said, you can get games, you know, you always start with one, then maybe two, generally an art and a code side, and you work on the design bits together. Uh, and it can just grow up to as many people as you can possibly fit in. There was something over this side, yes. I was wondering, you said you should make level one as easy as possible, mm. but if you make that the 
you get it without uh, doing an action? Are you really not making it not playable? Because I would think you got to do something to know mm -hmm. the game mechanics. No. So if you make the question, if you make the game so easy, are you not, you know, you're not, not really given a game at that point? And I do kind of agree with it. Uh, part of it is the player doesn't know that the game is going to be that easy. And when you start the game, you are essentially given a training level. You need to get them used to the controls. They need to learn how to jump. Then they need to learn how to run and jump at the same time. Uh, introducing these things uh, progressively one after the other allows them to experience the controls, get used to it, so when it really does matter, and they're going to die if they don't jump at the right point, they don't feel cheated if they if you do die, it's like, well, I've had enough chances at this, I've got through level one, I've done all my jumps before, it's then their fault for not having learnt the control system. Okay, I think we should stop there. We are time. Thank you. Okay.